All right, so we keep going here in Psalm number 119, looking at words for the word. Um, we did speak at some length, I guess, last time we came together about the idea that there are multiple words used in Psalm number 119 that all of which seem to have something to do with the law, the law of God, the word of God. And uh, we wanted to look at those and define those for our own understanding. And, and uh, today we're looking at the one that is called uh, testimonies. The first time that this word testimonies occurs in Psalm number 119 is verse 2. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. And uh, testimony, again, um, you will see is made into bold letters on the slide, and that is to draw your attention to the fact that's the word that we are talking about this evening. It is also the case, you see underneath there, a series of letters and numbers. It's H5713, uh, which is a Strong's number. We spoke a little bit about Strong's last time, but basically it's a concordance, and in his concordance, he has a number that corresponds to the the uh, the word being translated in the original language. In this case, it's Hebrew, and its number is 5713. That allows you to use tools like Blue Letter Bible to go put in H5713 and find all the other places where that same Hebrew word is being used, which may or may not correspond to the English word testimony or testimonies. That's the value of doing it that way. It lets you do basically a concordance search, but with the original language. And you don't even have to know any of the original language to do that. It's quite useful. And in fact, um, yeah, this is also here to remind me, to remind you that I don't know Hebrew. And so my study of this uh, can only go so far in the same way that perhaps yours does if you don't know Hebrew. But that's, you know, nonetheless, a pretty sharp tool. You can use the rest of the Bible to help define the meaning of this term. And it's pretty good, actually. Gives you an idea without knowing any Hebrew. So what then are these testimonies of which it speaks? You see the word testimonies getting used quite a bit. Um, and so... I picked out Genesis 21 and Joshua 24 as examples. They're not related to necessarily to the testimonies that we're talking about as the word of God. They're just definitions of this word. The first one, Genesis 21, is where he says, These seven ewe lambs you'll take from my hand. This will be a witness for me that I dug this well. So Jacob saying, this is my will. You take these seven lambs. That is a witness for me. That word witness is the same word in Psalm 119, verse 2, uh, that is translated with, uh, in that case, testimonies. Those who keep his testimonies are blessed. So here in Genesis 21, verse 30, the lambs... Um, that are taken from Jacob are the testimony or the witness that Jacob dug that well. That's the thing that they hold on to, the, the, if you will, it's the proof, the sign, uh, something that we can point to. Those are definitely his sheep and you have them. Why is that? They were given as this transaction took place to show this is Jacob's well. He dug this. Then in Genesis, or I'm sorry, Joshua 24 is another occurrence of the testimony or the witness. In this place, beginning at 26 and just down to the next verse, 27, Joshua wrote the words in the book of the law, that is Torah, the, that's the word we looked at last time, and took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord and said to all the people, behold, this stone will be a witness against us because it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us therefore it will be a witness against you lest you deal falsely with your God 
So we're talking about the fact that this thing is an eyewitness, if you will, or an ear witness, or whatever it is that this rock has. <laughs> you get the idea. It was there. It saw the agreement. It stands as a witness. It heard the words of the Lord spoken to us. And if you depart from those words, here it stands as a testimony. And perhaps it, it uh, you know, has that reference to the idea that this is the stone on which the words had been written, right? We looked earlier at uh, some of the whitewashed stones that were to be put up at the entrance to the promised land and written with large letters, etc. This could be an example of such a thing. But this stone that contains the word of the Lord is a witness, as in it saw this transaction take place and can verify that, yes, the word of God was given to you. Even though you're acting like you've never heard it before, Israel, <laughs> this is a witness, a testimony that, yes, you have. It is there. Somebody knows that it was there, right? So that's all that it means as I can tell from the context. Or in school, they call it context clues, I believe. But when I was studying this word, um, or really the occurrences of this word in the Bible, it seemed to me that the most important use of it was in Psalm 78, in the 78th Psalm. And that's where we'll spend most of this. Probably the most important use of the word for testimonies is in reference to the signs that God did in Egypt. That's what Psalm 78 does with it. So I just want to go through these, and, uh, and it's a, something of a lengthy reading, but we'll go quickly because the point is a simple one. In Psalm 78, beginning at verse 41 down through verse 58, the psalmist writes, They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power on the day when he redeemed them from the foe, when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the fields of Zoan. He turned their rivers to blood so they couldn't drink of their streams. He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them, frogs which destroyed them, gave their crops to the destroying locust, the fruit of their labor to a different locust destroyed their vines with hail, their sycamores with frost, gave over their cattle to the hail and their flocks to thunderbolts. He let loose on them his burning anger, wrath, indignation, and distress, a company of destroying angels. He made a path for his anger, didn't spare them from death, but gave their lives over to the plague. He struck down every firstborn in Egypt, the first fruits of their strength in the tents of Ham. So up until this point, these are the plagues that you read about in Exodus. The plagues that struck Egypt when the people were slaves in Egypt. When Moses and Aaron were going to the Pharaoh saying, The Lord says, let my people go. And they wouldn't. So these signs came, these what we call the plagues. But there are actually multiple different things happening, not just a plague which killed the firstborn. These he calls the testimony, if you will. These are the signs of his power. But remember where we started, which is the people forgot. So he continues. Then, after dealing with Egypt in this way, he led out his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And let me share with you something that I found that is just utterly fascinating. It's not related, but maybe will be interesting to you too, which is I've discovered in an unrelated study <laughs> that uh, Psalm 2 that says he will shatter them as earthen ve earthenware vessels. He will rule them with a rod of iron is usually what it's translated. The, the word for rod there is actually the word for staff. It's a shepherd's staff. He, and the verb for rule is not rule, it's shepherd. He will shepherd them 
with a staff of iron. Very interesting, because Egypt is called the Iron Furnace. And we read here that God led out his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. So God shepherded his people with a staff of iron, taking them out of the furnace of iron, which is Egypt. And it's a fascinating thing. Yes, of course he's the king, and of course he rules. But he rules like a shepherd. It's really something. I think it's fascinating. And more than just fascinating, it tells us something about the way that God rules. But continuing here in Psalm 78, he led them in safety so they weren't afraid, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. He brought them to his holy land, to the mountain which his right hand had won, Sinai drove out nations before them too and apportioned them for a possession and settled their tribes into their tents and yet they tested and rebelled against the most high God and did not keep his testimonies there's your word rather they turned away and acted treacherously like their fathers they twisted like a deceitful bow. They provoked him to anger with their high places. They moved him to jealousy with their idols. It is sad, but that's what happened. Nonetheless, the point being made is here, they tested and rebelled against him still, despite all these signs, and did not keep his testimonies. So they are the signs of his saving power the signs of his justice, the signs of his retribution over a sinful world and a sinful generation in Egypt. And the people didn't keep it. There was a testimony in that. There was a, a witness, if you will, to what happened to them and what God did to save them. And they ignored that. They didn't accept that valid testimony and act on it. That's the point of Psalm 78. And when you realize that that's the point of Psalm 78, you realize that the concept of God's word, God's actions, God's deeds among the sons of men as testimony is actually not unique. It is picked up and used all over the New Testament as well. So I invite you to walk with me in the New Testament here for a bit. But the fact is that in the New Testament, the witness or the testimony of God is also the word that he spoke to his servants, the signs that he performed to confirm that word that he spoke to his servants. And that these are the testimonies he expects for us to hang on to. These are not forsworn witnesses, who said that Jesus of Nazareth died and was buried and also was raised again from the dead. They saw him alive again. Their testimony is true. They are not forsworn witnesses. They're telling the truth. They are eyewitnesses of this. It is real. And the prophets also said these things. And Moses also said these things. They're all of them testimony. They're all of them witnesses to what God is doing in Christ Jesus. And I'm just going to start taking them here, not necessarily in any order, maybe book order. John chapter 5, though, is a very important reading about testimony and witnesses. Now, I understand that there's a lot of confusion in the world about testify and bear witness and that kind of thing um, you know if you enjoy the music of Parliament Funkadelic you know Testify is a great song but that's got nothing to do with God <laughs> and it is based on you know charismatic move, religious movements Pentecostal religious movements Holy Spirit stuff that's the basis of that song and its tonality right 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 but no, none of that has anything to do with God because there aren't any modern religious persons or unreligious persons who have witnessed anything. None of us are eyewitnesses of anything. We've seen nothing. 
the apostles have been gone the Lord has been gone from the earth for thousands of years we saw nothing we heard nothing nothing was said to us we have no testimony to bear we have no witness to bear we didn't see anything that's not valid but this is valid John 5 31 to 40 Jesus said if I alone bear witness about myself my testimony is not true but there is another who bears witness about me and I know that testimony he bears about me is true you know him too his name is John the Baptist you sent to John and he has borne witness to the truth not that his witness or his testimony is necessary not that the re testimony I receive is from man but I say this so that you may be saved that John he was a burning and shining lamp and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light but the testimony I have is greater than the testimony John bears the works the Father has given me to accomplish the very works I'm doing they bear witness about me that the Father has sent me so those are testimony the works he does in addition to the testimony of John a prophet we have the testimony of the miracles that Jesus does and more importantly the father who sent me has himself borne witness about me the father is born witness how his voice you've never heard his form you've never seen do you understand what that means <laughs> it's Psalm 19 there is no voice there are no words but the sound goes out through all the earth that's what that is his voice you haven't heard his form you haven't seen and you don't have his word abiding in you because you don't believe the one whom he has sent that's Jesus they don't believe Jesus he's on the witness stand and he's bearing testimony and his testimony is true but they don't believe it By this you know that the word is not abiding in them. They don't have God's word inside of themselves because, because you search the scriptures thinking that in them you have eternal life. But it is these scriptures that bear witness about me. And you still refuse to come to me so that you may have life. So the validity of the testimony is the word itself. The scriptures testify that this is the one. He's upbraiding because he was sent by God, and you know this in part because John bears testimony, and, and his testimony is known to be true, in part because Jesus is doing these miracles, but in major part because the Father himself bears witness through the word the Bible has been pointing to this time follow along with Jesus a little bit longer in the 44th verse of John 5 down to 47 how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and don't seek the glory that comes from the only God that's where we are how can you believe if you're not looking for the glory that comes from God but rather are concerned about what other people think you can't come to belief that way belief comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God seeking the glory that comes from the only true God means listening only to what God says the Bible don't think I, can, I will accuse you to the Father, said Jesus. There's one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you've set your hope. They did. They thought they were, they thought they were golden. They thought, yeah, we are the Jews. This Jesus, we don't really know where he's from. Which is visited again in John 9 with the blind man saying, it's incredible that you don't see where he's from. <laughs> Yeah, Moses is the one who will accuse you. Why? Because if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. And if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? That's what Jesus said about testimony.
Moses recorded what happened in Israel, or I'm sorry, in Egypt, in the case of Israel, the plagues and the things that happened back there. Do we believe those? I remember a very sad moment speaking with a friend of mine who was Israeli, modern citizen, modern country Israel, uh, about the law of Moses. I was talking to him about it, and uh, he was kind of disagreeing with me about a few things. And, and finally he said, look, you know, we, we, don't, we don't need to talk about this. I said, why not? He said, well, because you want to know what I think. I think a bunch of guys made this up. It's just a story, a nationalistic story for us to follow, to have some kind of identity. That's what he thought. I think that's not allowed, technically, under the laws of the modern Israeli state, but I'm sure that a lot of them do the same thing. <laughs> so I thought, oh, well, that's very different. I thought that you actually believed this book and that we might have an actual conversation between two persons, but no, they didn't believe, he didn't believe this, the, the writings of Moses. So that's a non-starter. There's no faith in the Word. And the Word is the genesis of faith. Think about this in John 18, which we read this morning over the Lord's Supper. Pilate asked Jesus, you're a king? He said, you said it, I am a king. For this purpose I was born, for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. What he means by that is, I'm the king of everybody who loves truth. That's what that means. To bear witness to truth. Did Jesus witness truth? Yes, he did. He speaks authoritatively about truth. He's the author of truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Remember that, John 17? So he bears witness about this. And yes, yeah, for the translation up there earlier, um, you know, some of them will say, well, you say I'm a king, as if he's denying that charge. That's not true. Uh, what it says there is you say it or you said it, which is a way of affirming correct is what that means idiomatically. I am a king. You are correct because I am a king is actually what it literally says. All right? So I don't accept those that try to throw doubt on it. And he specifies, I am the king of everyone who is of the truth. People who love truth. But his, you know, his kingdom is not of this world. If it were, his servants would be fighting. They're not. But he's bearing witness the truth is the thing that reigns. In Acts 10, Peter speaks to Romans who will become the first Christians among non-Jewish people. Acts 10, 40-43, Peter said, God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people of Israel, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he's the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead, which we did. But most importantly is verse 43. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's not just that the apostles know that he's raised from the dead, although they do, and their testimony is valid and captured for us in the New Testament, which is binding like any other word. It is the case that all the prophets bear witness to Jesus, which is what Jesus said in John 5. You think you have life in Moses, but you're not listening to what Moses said. You don't believe his words. I'm sorry, you don't believe his writings, or else you would believe my words. That's true. All the prophets bear witness to him. In Acts 14, when the Lord is working with his apostles, they're spreading the gospel throughout the land, throughout the Mediterranean. You find they have, there is a place 
recorded in verse 3 of Acts 14, where they remained a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, and the Lord for his part bore witness to the word of his grace by granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. It's just like Egypt. The signs and wonders, the things that he did in Egypt, were intended to be testimony. They're God's testimony, God bearing witness that this is true. This is so. This word is binding. In Hebrews, we have a couple of passages. They're more difficult, but it's all right. Let's do it together. Like old times, like a family. Hebrews 10, 15 to 18. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. How does he do this? See, the charismatics say, oh, that's right, he talks to me in my heart, or I hear it in my ear. No, that's not true. You may hear something. I can accept that you hear something, but it's not the Holy Spirit. I can tell you that for sure. The Holy Spirit bears witness to us. <coughs> oh, but it says he says things. That's right, he does say things. Like this. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. That's Jeremiah, the prophet. After which he adds, I'll remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. That's Jeremiah, the prophet. Now hold on. Are you telling me that this man, Jeremiah, who spoke words that got written down, was actually the Holy Spirit? No. We're saying he was a servant of the Most High God and the Holy Spirit spoke through him. The words that he wrote were the ones that God wanted him to write. Those are inspired. The Holy Spirit said those things through his servant, Jeremiah, when those things were written down and captured for us to read. So he is bearing witness when he says, there is another covenant coming. Not like the covenant made at Sinai with their fathers, a new covenant which is telling us that Jesus is coming, in which his laws are written on our hearts and our minds. And, he says, I'll remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. And Paul says, where there's forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. We have no need of offerings, according to the law of Moses, because Jesus is the perfect offering. There is no need for offerings for sin. We have forgiveness in Christ Jesus now. That's the meaning of this, and it's testified by Jeremiah, which is really by the Holy Spirit, as recorded in the book of Jeremiah. The Spirit testifies. The Spirit is the truth. Very consistent with what we said before, that Jesus has come and doesn't bear testimony to himself, but rather is born testimony by John, by miracles, by God in his word, by the Spirit, that he comes and he is a king. He's the king of everyone who believes the truth. The Spirit is the truth. The Spirit bears the testimony. That means the distinguishing marks can be identified by means of the Word of God, right? 3 John 12, there is a record of somebody named Demetrius who has received a good testimony, not just from everyone around him, but from the truth itself. The truth can testify about a person. What we mean by that is when you compare that person's walk to the Bible, you can see whether they are living right. And therefore, the truth bears testimony to them. All of that to say that the New Testament also has within it the same idea that we picked up on in Psalm 78, that the Word of God, the works of God, the signs of God, all of that are coming together to confirm the Word that was delivered, and those are the witness the testimony on the witness stand for us that God has given us his word and that is the thing that is to be kept 
In closing, go with me again through Psalm 119. Let's look at the places where it happens. Just to think about this a little bit, and I realize it's in fast forward, but I think it would be an incomplete lesson if you didn't revisit this. Look again at these testimonies and think about the word, the miracles, the record of the Bible as the testimony. Blessed are those who keep those testimonies, who seek, the, seek him with their whole heart. Do we read the Bible honestly, with the whole heart desiring to please him, coming to it with that kind of humility, right? 22nd verse of that psalm, number 119. Take away from me scorn and contempt, because I have kept your testimonies. If we believe what God said, if we hold to and fashion our lives according to that word, then we can have scorn and contempt removed. It's like what we read at 3 John 12. Demetrius has a testimony from the truth itself. At verse 24, your testimonies are my delight, they are my counselors. Right, where are you going to get advice from? It's going to be God's word. What is going to teach? Well, the things that God did there in Egypt, that'll teach. The things that God said to the prophets, that'll teach. 46, I'll speak too of your testimonies before kings and not be put to shame. Fascinating. What a prophecy of the time when the apostles would come and appear before kings and testify to what they have seen and heard in Jesus Christ, the resurrected from the dead. Amazing, is it not? In the 59th verse, when I think on my own ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. God's word is the guiding direction to go in. If I look at where I have been, where have I walked, I turn my feet to your testimonies. That's the compass. The thing we head towards is what's consistent with what God has said and what God has borne witness to. 79th verse, let those who fear you turn to me that they may know your testimonies. Yeah, saying that he wants to be a right example, a good example of somebody who is keeping the testimonies of God and therefore reflects them if others fear God and they look to this person, they can see in this person godliness. 95th verse, the wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. The wicked have a plan, they have a thing they're focused on, which is the destruction of the righteous, but the righteous is not thinking about the wicked or necessarily even avoiding traps. The righteous is consider considering God's word, God's testimony. And God takes care of his path and keeps him safe, right? That's the implication. 119th verse of the 119th Psalm. That's Psalm 119 squared. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore I love your testimonies. <laughs> I hold to what God has said because I know that in the end, if I walk a different way, I'll be discarded. That just is not going to lead anywhere. There's no future in refusing to keep God's word. 138th verse, you've appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. His testimonies are appointed, meaning what's recorded is recorded on purpose. He did that with something in mind, a purpose, a goal. And what's there is there on purpose, and what's not there is also not there on purpose. He did this in justice, complete justice, and also faithfulness. He's trustworthy. There's no dark side to God. 146th verse, I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. Yes, God will answer the prayer of the righteous person who is seeking to accomplish his will. 152nd verse, long have I known from your testimonies, you have founded them forever. From the beginning. God has been testifying to his word and to his truth. You see it in the way that he spoke to Adam and Eve after they sinned. You see it in the way that he spoke to Cain after he sinned. From of old, it was founded. 167th verse, my soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. 
He dedicated to that word. I keep your precepts, he continues, and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Yes, keep his precepts, his testimonies, because all my ways are before God. That's a view to there being God and to God seeing what you're doing and, and looking for his approval. It goes back to what Jesus said in John 5. I mean, how can you believe if you seek glory from men instead of the glory that comes from the only true God? If you come to him in simple trusting faith, if you come to him in humility, understanding that all your ways are before him, well, then you can keep those precepts and those testimonies. Then you can be pleasing to him. And that's it for testimonies. It actually is not that common a word in the Hebrew. There's a few occurrences. Most, I mean, the largest single repository of them is Psalm number 119. So we're done with that one. We'll come back to another word at another time. Today, are we speaking and perhaps you are not yet a child of God. You perhaps have not yet put your trust and your faith in him and obeyed him, putting on Jesus Christ to whom all the prophets bear testimony, and to whom all of the miracles bear testimony, to whom over 500 persons who knew him personally bore testimony that he lives. Today, put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. In the same way that he lives, you also can come back to life. A new creature created in Christ Jesus. Put to death the old person of sin. It doesn't have to be like it was. A new day is available in Christ because today is the day of salvation. Perhaps today as a Christian you have been living but not the way you should. Well, repent. Let us pray for you too. If you need today the prayers of the saints or you need to be baptized, either way, please let your need be known in the Spirit by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.